Jeff and Daniel McCarthy speaking of the job of the Energy Affordability Policy and Finance Committee in order. Today is Monday, March 2nd. The first order of business will be approval of the minutes from February 25th. By Representative Pounder, who's approval of those minutes? Any discussion? Saying none, all those in favor, please sign that by saying aye. Aye. Both say nay. How many one does it all be passed? The first item on our agenda is an overview of the extended employment uh, program for the Department of Employment and Economic Development. This first like to come forward. And as always, please state your name for the record and proceed to your testimony.
It's funded by a $6.8 million state appropriation from the general fund, uh, from the workforce development fund, excuse me, and a $5.7 million appropriation from the general fund. Aside from a small amount of uh, funds that support the administrative staff and need that manage the extended employment program, the majority of these funds go out to 28 community providers who are certified annually and are required to achieve and maintain the highest levels of service standards and accountability to the people that they serve. The people that are served in the extended employment program, again, are individuals with the most significant disabilities. They have three more functional limitations to, uh, to employment and that they require these ongoing supports in order to maintain and uh, advance in their career. Uh, in 2014, the extended employment program served nearly 5,000 people, uh, 5,000 Minnesotans, and these workers representing a wide range of disabilities, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, individuals with serious mental illness, traumatic brain injury, individuals on the autism spectrum. Uh, those individuals received the ongoing employment supports necessary to add nearly 4 million work hours to the state's productive capacity earning nearly $28 million in personal income, yielding a return on investment of $15 for each one of the companies. I apologize, I heard my contract announced that there was $5.7 million from the general fund and the workforce development fund. Well, $6.8 million from the workforce development fund and $5.7 million from the general fund. And are those for fiscal years 14 and 15 or 16 and 17? Those are 14 and 15. Do you know what the projections are for 16 and 17 for those amounts? We can phone a friend. Not here. Phone a friend. Yeah. We can. Uh, is this uh, Hendrix? Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, also in your packet is an overview that Ada Newman from House Research and uh, myself put together with both an overview of the programs as well as the funding that was uh, going back to fiscal year 2012 and uh, four to 2017, so the uh, same numbers can be found in that available cheat sheet. So in the future, I'll just read my packet. My apologies. I'll just proceed to test on the On the next slide, you'll see that the Extended Employment Program um, provides support to individuals with significant disabilities in one or more of three possible employment settings. The first setting, center-based employment, uh, is essentially employment that's on the premises of an uh, extended employment provider where the majority of workers are individuals with significant disabilities and the wages are typically less than minimum wage. Uh, Center-based employment is more commonly known as sheltered work. The second setting for extended employment work is community employment where it's employment that's in the community uh, typically uh, with individuals, in dis individuals with disabilities that are working as part of a crew, uh, such as a cleaning crew, and uh, they are, are working, as I said, in the community, and they may or may not be earning above minimum wage. The third setting that extended employment services are provided in is supported employment, and that typically is the level of employment where individuals are working independently with supports, and they're working in a competitive setting uh, and are being paid at least minimum wage. What's important to know is regardless of the setting that extended employment workers are, are working in, it's important to know that absent the supports they get from the extended employment program, they would most likely not be able to maintain their job. Uh, and also, the majority of the extended employment workers may, in fact, be working in one or more settings. It's not uncommon for individuals to start out their day working in a center-based employment and then perhaps going out into the community as part of a crew uh, to be working in a community-based employment setting. As you'll see on this graph, uh, you'll see that over the last 25 years, and certainly when we started with the extended employment program, the majority of the funds were being used to support individuals in facility-based employment or center-based employment. But with the signing of the ADA and with greater emphasis on supporting individuals with disabilities in community-based jobs, the investment of the extended employment program dollars shifted to supporting more people in community-based jobs. 
currently it is in 2013, we have 81% of the extended employment uh, dollars are used to support individuals in community-based jobs. And they, together with the extended employment providers, have worked collaboratively to shift those investments to support people working in the community. Recently, uh, DEED has convened an extended employment rulemaking advisory group because we recognize that it is time with all of the changes that are happening in disability employment services, it's time to update the rule to make sure that the rule is aligned with the changes that have happened at the federal level and the state level. Um, so uh, this committee, in fact, will be reviewing a policy bill uh, that is proposing some changes to the extended employment related statutes. Uh, essentially what this policy bill will be doing will be collapsing those three settings into two, uh, a non-competitive setting and a supportive employment, and it will be aligning definitions with the new definitions that we see in, in the Rehabilitation Act and other federal legislation. Uh, I want to take a minute to highlight uh, the governor's proposal related to the extended employment program. And the governor is recommending that we continue that a uh, one time increase to the rates paid to extended employment providers be increased. Um, the extended employment providers are paid a specified rate for each hour worked by an extended employment worker. And the extended employment program is funded on a totally outcome-based system. In other words, providers will earn their contract by reporting the number of hours worked by extended employment workers that are working with, with their organizations. In recent years, uh, the providers have struggled with increased costs in staffing and benefits. Uh, the rates, frankly, haven't kept up with those costs. And so the legislature uh, authorized a one-time uh, increase in those rates. The governor is recommending that that one-time increase be extended. And certainly from these perspective, we believe that that's a modest and necessary, uh, necessary increase. Uh, because frankly, if that wasn't uh, continued, then what would happen is that the uh, extended employment providers would be facing a 2% cut in their rates and would likely have difficulty maintaining the current level of services that they provide. Also, I think it's important to note that over 55% of the extended employment workers uh, live and work in Greater Minnesota, so providers in Greater Minnesota would uh, certainly be impacted uh, if the one-time increase was not continued uh, into the base. I know that uh, next on your agenda after the extended employment overview is a review of the war bill, uh, which is putting in a request for transition dollars for extended employment providers in light of uh, the Olmstead plan. And what I wanted to do this afternoon is to provide you a, a very brief kind of overview of the changes that are happening in disability employment services. Um, I've had the privilege of being in this position, uh, serving Minnesotans with disabilities for almost 10 years. And I have to say that there is today a sea change, a major transformation happening across the country in disability employment services. We've certainly seen a lot of change happen here in Minnesota, but it is by no means limited to Minnesota. This is happening across the country. And as you see listed on the slide here, it really starts with the Americans with Disabilities Act that was signed in 1990 by President Bush. Uh, at that point in time, it was viewed as the most um, sweeping civil rights legislation ever to have been passed, uh, targeted to individuals with disabilities. And in particular, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act has been getting a lot of attention in the last several years. That section of the ADA basically uh, articulates that unjustified segregation is in fact discriminating against individuals with disabilities, and so it, it cannot continue. That's the nature that was really the substance of Title II. In 1999, the U.S. Supreme Court heard a decision or heard a case, Olmstead versus LC, and that is what you probably come to hear about or know as the Olmstead decision. 
Essentially, what that decision said was that it enforced, reinforced Title II of the ADA and said that public entities have obligations to ensure that individuals with significant disabilities are not going to be unjustly segregated. In fact, what, and this was the, what they called the integration mandate, what um, the Olmstead decision articulated is that public entities are required to provide community-based services to persons with disabilities when such services are appropriate, when the affected persons do not oppose community-based treatment, and community-based treatments can be reasonably accommodated. Now, the Olmstead decision was 1999, and states uh, uh, were dragging their feet a bit in implementing uh, that uh, decision, and so the Department of Justice in 2009 uh, rigorously stepped up its enforcement of the Olmstead decision. And most notably, cases in Rhode Island and in Oregon specifically called out shelter workshops as being a violation of the ADA and you know, contrary to the Olmstead decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1999. So that's an important backdrop to all of the sea change that's happening with disability employment, but that is not the only piece. Uh, in July, on July 22nd of 2014, President Obama signed the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act that essentially reauthorizes the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which is the legislation that uh, uh, governs the public vocational rehabilitation program. In the Workforce Innovation and uh, Opportunity Act, uh, clearly the legislation put a stake in the ground related to segregated employment. Specifically, effective July of 2016, it puts the VR program at a gatekeeper role to shelter workshops. In order for youth with significant disabilities to be working in a segregated setting at some minimum wage, they have to first go through the VR door. In order uh, for individuals that are already working, for adults that are already working in a sub-minimum wage in a sheltered workshop, effective July of 2016, the VR program will be expected to annually assess those individuals to see if they, in fact, can be successful in community-based employment. And if so, the expectation is that we provide them the supports and resources to be able to achieve that goal. So you have the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Also, in March of 2014, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services uh, published the final rule governing home and community-based services. While that rule doesn't directly impact individuals participating in the extended employment program, it certainly impacts the providers uh, who are extended employment providers and also are serving individuals that are funded under the waiver programs. What the final rule requires is that individuals that are uh, receiving employment services in waiver funded programs must have full access to the benefits of community living and have the opportunity to receive services in the most integrated setting possible. Finally, you've probably heard that Minnesota uh, settled uh, a lawsuit, the Jensen case and the Jensen settlement that required the state of Minnesota to develop an Olmstead plan. The governor convened a sub-cabinet. Uh, that sub-cabinet has developed an Olmstead plan, and the overall goal of that plan, the Minnesota's Olmstead plan, is that Minnesota will be a place where people with disabilities are living, learning, working, and enjoying life in the most integrated setting. Specifically, as it relates to employment, the Minnesota Olmstead Plan calls for the expansion of competitive employment for youth and adults with disabilities, aligning policies and funding across agencies to expand integrated employment, including adopting an employment-first policy and providing training and technical assistance, public information, and outreach on employment in the most integrated setting. This is clearly a collaborative effort in, involving eight agencies, including DEED. Now, when you uh, saw that slide before that demonstrated the investment of the extended employment program in, in the late 80s, the majority of investments were supporting individuals and supported employment. Today, 81% are supporting people in integrated uh, 
employment, you'll see that the extended employment program really has led the way, if you will, in terms of transitioning the system uh, to support individuals in the community. Um, but it's important, I think, as you hear conversations around the Olmstead plan, that you understand that it's not just the Minnesota uh, Olmstead plan, but it's changes at the federal level, in legislation, in rural, as well as in court action that have brought us to the stage that says, yes, we have made progress, slow but sure progress, in assisting individuals with significant disabilities in uh, finding and retaining employment in the community. But these changes require that states step up the pace and that we move much quicker. With that, I'll turn it back to Judy. Congrats, Wallace. Thank you, Kim, for that excellent overview of our program. Mr. Chair, that is the end of our presentation. We'd like to open ourselves up to questions at this time. So before we go to Ms. Hendricks and Ms. Newman for uh, their overview, we'll take questions from us to the Representative Hartman and then Representative Lowe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Heck? Yeah. I was I wonder you use the phrase the VR door, and I'm guessing when you say VR, you mean vocational rehabilitation, with the idea being that somebody doesn't um, get into an opportunity where they're earning sub-minimum wage before we determine whether they're eligible for regular employment. Mr. Chair, Representative, that, that is correct. And following federal legislation, it was absolutely clear that Congress's intent was to direct a public vocational rehabilitation program to step up more assertively in reducing, if not eliminating, the tracking of youth with significant disabilities into shelter worships. Representative Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The director of my, uh, in my, my real world, I have an insurance agency who utilizes some of these, these people, these services has actually been a strong asset for us. And when that got set up, and, and on an ongoing basis, the, the caseworker, if you will, who was the facilitating this, more or less coached me as to an income cap we were allowed, uh, that that person was allowed to earn because of some type of penalty. And I didn't, I, I'm uh, blurry as to how that works. And so we could only offer so many hours a week to that. Could you explain how that works or what that would be? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I presume that what you're referring to uh, are the disincentives that exist. If individuals are receiving public benefits, let's like say, for instance, Social Security disability insurance, they have a limit to how much that they can earn before their benefits will be negatively impacted. That's one of the things that we've been working very hard in the public VR program is to provide information up front for individuals to really understand about if they go back to work, what will be the impact on their benefits? And, and frankly, there's a lot of misinformation out there. You know, we would love, frankly, to have the opportunity to have a conversation with that case manager uh, because uh, for the most part, uh, Social Security disability is not uh, is not a living wage, and so the more that people are able to be economically self-sufficient, I think that typically is the preferred route that individuals would like to go, and certainly I think from a public policy perspective, that's the direction that we're moving in as well. Representative Luna, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, in this instance, what happened was is the, the caseworker, and you know, probably well intended, but created a situation where uh, these employees of mine uh, just would not work more hours. They were, they were kind of coached away from it. And, uh, you know, the trust factor was with the caseworker, not with me. And uh, it was, I just seen some opportunity there for, you know, there was more things that uh, they could have done that would have helped our business, would have helped them and developed them, but they made a cap on, the, on basically what they could take home every week. I, uh, I'd like to know how they determine, like I, I hired also these individuals at my grocery store in the past, and they would uh, have a way they would determine what salary I would pay them, based on what, do you know? Ms. Beck. Mr. Chair, Representative Gunther, um, I would imagine that the situation that you're referring to may be a situation where an individual is 
being paid less than minimum wage, and I understand from the Department of Labor that there are pretty rigid and strict uh, processes that need to be followed to determine what the uh, appropriate wage would be. That there is a lot of conversation at the national level around the sub-minimum wage certificate, and in fact, one of the components of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act was creating an advisory committee to uh, develop a report, to study and develop a report to go to the Department of Labor and Department of Education about the efficacy of continuing the sub-minimum wage certificate going forward. Uh, so I think that, again, part of that sea change is that uh, there's really an examination of whether the sub-minimum wage certificates are in fact necessary anymore as we can leverage assistive technology, as we can work with businesses to develop their ability to provide more natural supports. It, it certainly is our belief that more and more individuals with significant disabilities can work competitively and earn at least minimum wage. I think it's true, and uh, the way I recall it, they would take one of the existing employees and have him do the task that this person was capable of doing, and they would time him with a stopwatch to see how he would compare with the employee I had and what he would do, and they would determine what percentage that person was doing of my existing employee. And that's how they would determine his salary or her salary. And uh, they would reevaluate that every year or so because hopefully they would gain proficiency and they would get more of a salary increase that way. So that's the way they work with us. And I, I just assume that it's typical. Mr. Chairman, President of Gunther, uh, again, those productivity measures uh, are used when individuals. Uh, are being paid some minimum wage because the entities, in this case the community provider, has to demonstrate to the Department of Labor that they are appropriately and accurately using those some minimum wage certificates. Again, however, that the conversation and the policy discussion that is emerging is whether those some minimum wage certificates are in fact necessary. Uh, and so I, I think the jury is out yet on that, but uh, that is really part of the sea change that uh, we're currently in the midst of. Representative Mahoney and then Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, really quite three questions here. They're all kind of related. Um, how, many, how many disabled people could be, um, uh, could be served by you. I mean, that's the total population that is servable by your uh, agency, and how many of them do you serve? Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative Mahoney, in our comprehensive statewide needs assessment that we uh, provide to our federal funder each year, we estimate that the number of individuals that would be eligible for services in the VR program to be about 150,000 people. In the VR program, we currently serve, uh, at any point in time, there's roughly about between 18 to 20,000 people uh, being served in VR. Uh, in the extended employment program, as I said, we're serving between five and 6,000 people, and that really is at capacity given the limited funds. Uh, the independent living program, um, you know, they have the opportunity to provide uh, information referral services, so they do uh, provide those services to tens of thousands of people, but individuals that actually have a service case with IL is roughly around 6,000 people. Then in, in some of the uh, notes that we have here, you talk about serving 5,000 and something uh, a year. Uh, is there a, a repeat? How many are new uh, individuals that you help every year, or you help the same 5,000 every year? Mr. Chair, Representative Mahoney, that 5,000 for the most part are people who are receiving ongoing support. And so uh, typically the only way that people will leave the extended employment program is if they retire or if they die. Uh, and uh, that's one of the challenges, frankly, because 
this, this system has been in capacity for so really long. And one of the challenges that we have in the public data program is that one of our obligations is when we're working with people initially to provide that upfront skill training, we need to assess whether they need ongoing supports in order to be successful. And if they need those ongoing supports, but we can't find a resource for that, we're not to provide employment training services to those individuals because essentially we're not to set them up to fail. So that is that is a significant challenge in terms of are there adequate ongoing supports for individuals with significant disabilities. I want to know too that the certainly provides through the extended employment program provides services that provide ongoing supports. Those types of services are also funded under the waiver programs. Um, I'm going to assume you have counselors that, that uh, help these individuals with their extended employment. How many uh, uh, individuals does a particular counselor uh, deal with as a case management process? Is it one, one person per one counselor, or is it 10 people per counselor uh, in a year? Mr. Chair, Representative Gunther, um, in the in the VR program, the average caseload size for the VR counselor is between 80 to 120 cases. Um, I can't speak to the number of cases that an extended employment job coach or employment specialist would carry. I would actually need to look to one of our uh, community provider colleagues to uh, provide that information. Thank you. Uh, Representative Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to double check again on the, on the wage of the um, probation that's here. So it looks like one of the things we'd be doing would be preventing the basic rate, wage rate for people on the to play from dropping to even more so than minimum wage by, by this probation. But what then is the goal? At what rate? This is 406 now, is what the, the rate is. What is the expected rate as a result of if we appropriate these dollars? Mr. Chair, Representative Clark, the rate that we pay extended employment providers is different than the wage earned by the extended employment worker. All uh, extended employment uh, providers earn a set hourly rate per the setting of the services being paid. For instance, if an extended employment provider is supporting someone in supporting employment, for every hour that that individual is working in their job, the extended employment provider is paid, I believe, $4.09 per hour to provide those supports. And the amount decreases with competitive employment and center-based employment. And that's part of what you see, the transition of the investment of, of dollars over the years, is that uh, the higher rate is paid to support individuals in supported employment. So the subminimum wage or the wage paid to the worker uh, is unrelated to the rate that the extended employment providers get only in the sense of what is the setting that the individual worker is employed in. Representative Clark. Sure, I guess maybe this is a more of a, a ongoing discussion, but is there any chance that some of that is passed on or what kind of expectation is it so that increase would be passed on to the worker themselves? Ms. Mr. Chair, Representative Clark, um, one of the advantages, as I understand it, in talking with extended employment providers is that the dollars that they earn in the extended employment uh, program are relatively fungible and that they can spend them really in whatever way makes the most sense. Um, now, whether that would be on, on staff increases, uh, staff that are providing the supports, or whether they are in fact uh, the employer of record and whether that would translate into wage increases for the uh, 
uh, for the workers themselves, that would be a question that I would have to defer to the individual provider uh, in those cases that they actually act as the employer. Mr. Chair, maybe this is just a uh, question that we could get back to the committee, that come back to the committee, and I'd just like to know how we're doing in terms of wage rates in general for the people in unexpected employment as it has it changed with kind of a historical um, review of where we've been with that subminimum wage and where would I, where would you see us going? Um, and I think it does impact the whole issue of people who are on some sort of like social security disability or other things and how that, how that affects them and just, I guess I'm just curious as to how how those things interact with each other and, and whether or not, really whether or not people in those jobs can expect to have any sort of increase. And it was, I would assume that they may be kind of important for motivation and not going on this to jump to work. I think Representative Clark, you bring up the point and also the interaction with the, uh, the higher minimum wages, the higher minimum wage law that passed last year as it is going forward. So, uh, any closing comments from our testifiers? Thank you very much for the presentation. Appreciate it today. Uh, as we move on to Ms. Hendricks and Ms. Newman, we're going to provide an overview of the State Vocational and Rehabilitation Services and Olmstead Plan. Should sure, I want to go to the test of the table? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think the chair wants to get the test of the table today. You too, Ms. Newman. <laughs> that way you get on TV today. That's the way you get on TV. Say hi to loved ones and our, own, our staff is always so enthusiastic to watch TV. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, so the packet is this overview uh, of um, these vocational rehabilitation uh, services, um, as well as uh, on the second page or under the back site, um, the Minnesota Homestead um, Plan, and a particular emphasis on the funding levels uh, for those programs. So I won't really go into detail. Read it, and uh, I think we've already heard from Dee about a lot of the details. Uh, they speak mostly about that last um, program, the extended employment program. So there's three more programs um, uh, within vocational rehabilitation. The first two um, also receive federal funds. Um, it's about um, a little over 50 million uh, in total per year in uh, federal funds. And then uh, the table below that shows the state funding for these programs. So I need to notice that. Um, most of the funds come from the general fund, except for $6.8 million ongoing uh, money from the uh, development fund for standard employment program at the very last line. Uh, and another thing to note is uh, that most of this money is ongoing uh, and is in the base budget uh, with um, some uh, one-time uh, appropriations. And for instance, the uh, extended employment program that I just mentioned with the workforce development funds under 2015, fiscal year 2015, um, membership CF, 7.08 uh, million appropriation. So that is that $250,000 um, increase of uh, one time that now, uh, if you turn to the next page, the government uh, recommends to make that uh, an on ongoing appropriation uh, and it will go into the base budget. Uh, in terms of the Minnesota Homestead Plan, uh, put together a brief overview and many of the facts have already been mentioned um, as well, but in terms of past funding, uh, in 2014, the legislature uh, appropriated $500,000 uh, as a one-time um, in fiscal year 2015 and then ongoing $875,000 uh, for fiscal years 2016 and 17 for the Homestead Implementation Office. And that is to deed as deed service the fiscal agent for his office, although the office is cross agency. And then the recommendation from the governor uh, for the 2016 and 17 budget. Uh, so, anyone wants to add anything? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, no, Ms. Peck and Ms. Hendricks have already really covered the programs. I might point out, however, um, in response partially to um, Representative Clark's question about the wage rates in the governor's uh, in the budget book, 
Uh, there is a breakdown of uh, the average hourly wages for individuals in non-competitive programs versus the competitive employment programs. Um, and that information indicates that the average hourly wage for persons employed in the non-competitive programs was $4.63 an hour. And for those individuals in those competitive employment programs, the average wage is $10.12. Mr. James, on a clarification, I could guess that after the appropriation, if the impact of the appropriation would raise it, then when I information says from $4.06 to $4.66, is that correct? Mr. Chair and Representative Clark, the numbers in the governor's budget book are for the um, the fiscal year 2014 numbers, so those would be under the current law. Mm -hmm. However, just to, to, to reiterate um, the point that Ms. Peck was making is that there is the difference between the, um, the provider rate and the wage rate paid to the individual, and, and there is a significant difference in, in what that means. I guess we just need to get information about what the actual rate is that the individuals are earning and, and then what the impact would be by this appropriation. If you think it can be known, it sounds like, Mr. Chairman, there's no definite requirement that an increase to the employer is passed on to the worker. And I guess that would be important to know. Well, I'll let Mr. Fancy question that Ms. Newman is in Mr. Chair and Representative Clark, the Provider reimbursement rate, as, as Ms. Peck said, that uh, is at the discretion of the provider and for those providers that are actually the employers, that rate covers the administrative costs plus they can uh, augment the wage rate to the, um, to the worker itself. But that is, that is a discretionary item and those, the numbers I gave you were um, would indicate the actual wage under current law that the workers are receiving. Mm -hmm. uh, is what the employer is receiving. That is the provider. That is the employer. The, the, the um, provider reimbursement rate. Right. So do we have, actually, Mr. Chairman, do we actually have what the wage rate is. So, I would just like to testify as to why we kind of take this back from the top, just go to the beginning, and explain how uh, I guess we're dealing with a couple of different hypotheticals here of different programs. Let's start with uh, those employees who are in, uh, who are working in the center. I think the term you used was a, you know, a, a closed workforce, and explain the, the funds that go into that program and the funds that go out of the program. Mr. Chair and members, I think Ms. Peck is much more well versed in how that works. Thank you. So, Ms. Peck, thank you very much for coming back to the table. And if you could um, just give us a, a single hypothetical of a, of a worker uh, who is using extended employment services, you know, what if members of the committee? I'm not familiar with this program, but I think President um, Clark has some good questions. Just kind of walk through a hypothetical employee. No need to go through all the possibles, but just give a situation in where uh, what their wage is, how it's determined, and where the assistance is coming from, um, and what the private employer is actually paying for what they receive. That may be helpful for Representative Clark and other members of the well, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, uh, what I would like to request is that we could ask one of the providers to come up and describe that very process because, you know, we reimburse the providers based on the hours that extended employers, ex extended employee workers uh, work, but the mechanics of it, truly I can't speak to that as effectively. Uh, Steve Ditchler from Proact. Uh, is an extended employment provider, so with your permission, I'd like to ask him to come up and speak specifically in terms of how did he work that magic on their end? 
I just noticed that Miss Newman and Miss Hendricks definitely
So based on that productivity, um, whether we get more money in the system or not, the wage has to go up. It's reviewed every six months, I would so to say. It's reviewed at least annually. For somebody out in the community, it has to be uh, reviewed every six months. It typically goes up. It doesn't matter if we get money or not. The, the money we use to pay that wage in the case yeah, I'm going to take very more of my three minutes. I'll shorten this up. No, 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 so we will offer, providers will offer, I think all of us will offer to be the employer of record and say, if you will hire my person, I'll keep them on payroll. You don't have to worry about workers, now on it, on that comp, theft, whatever, we we'll cover all of that. We have the insurance to do that. To do that, we've had a job developer, a job coach, we're involved in the community. That's what the hourly um, rate pays for the structure to do that. Remember, we don't get reimbursed until they put client works for an hour, and we get 406. If they're incentive based, we get a dollar ninety-one. There's built-in incentives to move them out. The other way to do that, and the ultimate best outcome for some for somebody we serve, is integrated competitive employment uh, on the payroll of the employer, and, and hopefully we will fade that support off if somebody didn't need it anymore and discontinue it. Yes, I can back match it. For some of the folks, that's harder to do in that system. So if the employer pays, they pay what they pay, they meet all the wage and hour laws. If we're at that employer of record, we have to pay wages based on productivity, quality, and quantity, regardless of what we're reimbursed um, through a system that requires us to get prevailing wage survey, things like that. So they're, they're disconnected when the minimum wage up and up. So we'll go up again and typically impacts. Um, the prevailing wage. The prevailing wage is rarely, if ever, the minimum wage. You can have somebody on a commensurate wage, special wage certificate that makes more than the minimum wage. If that prevailing wage is $16 an hour and somebody's at 15% or 50% productivity, they would be at the minimum wage. So not all special wage certificate wages are under the minimum. Most of them are, though, quite honestly. So. There's that difference. The wage benefit package will go with the employer of record. Um, but the wages go up and are related to productivity, quality, quantity, not the rate we get from the state. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any other comments? No, oh, I'm hoping to speak the bill. I, I, I think one of the, the second piece on this is the Olmstead transition. Uh, that does, and you heard all that because we built that, but I think we are faced with kind of a daunting task. Uh, most of the individuals with pretty good chance for success has been moved out over the past since 1984. So, you know, those that have to transition kind of requires special needs and uh, to deal with all that, transform our business model and all that. That's part of the money, the money is statewide, is to let us uh, kind of embrace the spirit of Olmstead and get everybody out. I will. I think I can speak for. I can speak for 100 percent of the providers. All providers are interested in the maximum level of employment for the people they serve. We are the ones with the boots on the ground, loving the parents in the face, loving at the individuals in the face. We would like nothing better than to put ourselves out of business, getting everybody in place, but all supports in the community in this great state of Minnesota. So. We, we are not dragging our feet. We're not obstructionists. Uh, we do have the task of making it happen, however, and that sometimes puts it as at odds with the ideal, maybe. And with that, I'll turn my comments. We have questions. Oh, and Lisa Hite just joined us in, uh, at the uh, desk here, and she joined us because she had a special grant to try to move everybody out of the ceremony setting and into the community. The other thing we're not talking about here is not just moving them out of the center of the community, but moving them out of some placements where we have groups of people at a business 
and getting close to individual placements so the movement isn't just center-based. We want to let the guy down bars, uh, like I said, and the great community employment on the payroll of the business, not the provider. So that all to go over this thing. Welcome to the Please state your name for the record. My name is Lisa Parte. I am the Director of Labor Services um, for an organization called Functional Industries located in Buffalo, Minnesota. Um, uh, Representative O'Neill is our district representative, and unfortunately she's not here today, but she has spent um, a couple of days with us getting to know our services, and that has been greatly appreciated, and we are really excited to continue developing that relationship with her. Um, Functional Industries is an organization which provides an array of employment services to individuals with disabilities in Wright County, Sherman County, and Stewart's County. Um, we offer, amongst these services, extended employment services, both center-based and community-based services. Um, Functional Industries has been a long-time supporter of Homestead and giving individuals as many choices as possible for work settings and supports. In 2010, as Steve alluded to, um, Functional Industries was awarded a half a million dollar grant from Dean for a project which was named Enduring Vision. Um, this was a pilot project set in motion to determine what exactly it would take to move individuals from that extended employment center-based program to community employment. Um, the time frame that was involved with this initial project was approximately 17 months. Um, as a quick overview of the project, there were 182 participants. Of these 182, 97 completed intakes into the program in hopes of obtaining community employment. 77 individuals chose that they did not want to leave the center-based programs, and eight did not complete the intake process. They just kind of fell off the map. Um, of the 97 who completed intakes, 20 obtained supported employment. They were um, employed by community employers and had more than minimum wage jobs or minimum wage. Um, of the 182 who participated, 96 are now employed on community crews. So there was that movement from center-based to both community crews and to supported employment. Um, the remaining individuals were either moved to more intensive services to have better met their needs, or they terminated services and now remain at home with no services at all. Um, some of the significant findings that we found with this project, which relate to why we're here today, um, there are significant barriers to obtaining community employment, such as individuals lack of flexibility with their schedules. Individuals only want to work certain hours, certain days, and that makes it very difficult sometimes to find that community employment for them. Transportation, um, especially in the more rural areas, is very difficult. People don't have options for public transportation when you're working in greater Minnesota. Um, individuals choosing not to participate and then guardians creating barriers to the process by not returning paperwork in a timely manner. Um, on a funding level, it was found that there was not enough money to fund the supports necessary for success in the time frame that was given. Um, therefore, there are some individuals who need, whose needs were too high to support and needed more training opportunities. Um, they were moved to more intensive supports. And these supports were then funded by waiver dollars under the Health and Human Services budget. Unfortunately, as I understand it, the Health and Human Services budget is now being cut back, which again will limit the supports that can be provided for, for these individuals. Um, upon the completion of the Enduring Vision project, Private sector funds were sought so that we could continue the project. We found that people wanted to work in the community, people wanted to move out of center base, and we wanted to see that happen. But how do we keep that going? So we ended up with a grant from Bremer Foundation to be able to continue that project and, and move forward. Um, we were able to see success. Um, through Wright County and the Bremer Foundation. Unfortunately, um, as we all know, the public sector's funds are limited as well, and for them to be able to assist with moving people into the community um, can be very difficult because there are limited funds there. Of those who do not have access to wavered funds, there's one gentleman who's now sitting at home without services um, because he did not have any funding to pay for those more intensive supports that were needed. Um, 
and he does not qualify for vocational rehab services. So there, there's, there was nothing for him. There's kind of a void. Um, the irony of the situation is that while we were working so hard to move people into the community um, and get them employed there, for some, the opposite effect happens. They end up with no services. Um, there's many individuals we serve in our extended employment program in greater Minnesota that have needs that disqualify them from vocational rehab services. Um, this is Mary Ann. Mary Ann is one of these individuals. She has cerebral palsy and is confined to a wheelchair with very limited physical abilities. However, her mind is very sharp. She's very, very concerned about her future and especially with the Olmstead plan coming into effect. Um, she has very real concerns that her future may consist of sitting at home without work because there are few employers who would hire her with her level of disability. Um, in her exact words, work is very important to me. Without it, I do not feel good about myself. Who is going to hire me? I don't want to end up sitting at home. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Clayton. Welcome to the committee, Christine Trading Clerk. Good afternoon. My name is Clay Clayton. I'm the Vice President of Programs and Centers for the Occupation and Development Center. Our organization has nine locations throughout North Minnesota, Fiji, our corporate offices in Thief River. We also have offices in Warren and Bodette, Grand Rapids, Fiji, Tulsa, International Falls, and Nabil. I'm also here as a member of more, and as Steve mentioned earlier, we all heard that we support this bill, and one of the biggest reasons, as was previously brought up, of course, was the home state mandate. And I think the easiest way to look at it is that under home they want to make sure that people are automatically just Someone get into a sheltered workshop or an 18-H program or some other segregated setting. What was the second term you were talking about? An 18-H program or maybe something called a day training and two training. It was an 18-H day training and day training and education. I don't know. Of course, I don't know. I just didn't have to say it anyway. I just wanted to hear it. And, and of course, they want to make sure that each individual has the opportunity to realize their full potential in employment. And I think that's something that we can all understand. But as we prepare to transition more individuals into the community in non segregated environments, it's going to be a, a huge transition. And I think from one of the biggest issues that we're going to face, or biggest tasks that we're going to face, is education, not only for the consumers, but also the families and the businesses that we work with, and probably the general public too, on what individuals with disabilities can really do and get rid of a lot of the misinformation that's out there. As was brought up before, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about how the wages are determined for some people, or businesses are unsure if they should hire someone because they're afraid of liabilities. Um, there's just a, a ton of misinformation that affects everybody. And also for the providers, we're going to need to be hiring additional staff to do the job search and job development duties that are going to be necessary to find jobs for these individuals. We need more job coaches to actually work with them and make sure that they're doing the jobs properly. And sometimes we just need staff to provide the transportation. And transportation seems to be coming up a larger and larger issue, especially all across the rural areas. It just never seems to end. A lot of times we get individuals to be hired into a position only to find out there's no transportation available for them and the providers themselves need, end up needing to provide that individual's transportation. Go pick them up, bring them to work, go pick them up, bring them home from work. 
sometimes his job coach can, can be clean, but it varies from person to person. I think that also uh, can be brought up that it's not just the bounce that's pushing the changes in integration, but it's also uh, the way that we are Sales from Medicare Medicaid services that she mentioned, and then the Department of Justice is taking a major role in making sure that all these necessary changes take place. And the only way that we're ever going to be successful is we all work together to make sure that consumers are getting the opportunities they deserve. And if we don't, if we're not successful, it's some of our most vulnerable citizens that are going to suffer because of it. So I ask that all of you support this bill for funding and enable us to move forward and get more and more people out into the community working. Thank you. I thank you very much, Senator. And that's a couple of questions for our testifiers. So I think we all share the goal of uh, moving disabled individuals from sheltered workplace to community integration. But as you somewhat alluded to, in our discussion, Sometimes there's various reasons why that simply just is not in the best interests of um, the employee. Um, what is, to what degree are the regulatory and judicial agencies responding to this and recognizing that there is a, there's not a one size fits all approach to this? What, I mean, to, to what degree can, can we assist in making sure they understand that, that while we all share that goal, um, that it, it may, it's not. It's not 100% for everyone. Yeah, well, that's a very difficult uh, question to answer, Mr. Chair. And I'm not sure that everyone is understanding that at the federal level. Um, just for example, if you look at some of the other states that have gone through the whole state process, they just decided to eliminate, for example, the center base. And that's, that's not appropriate. Yeah, that's not a solution. And it will leave some people behind. And where do they go? Some of these states are trying to figure out that. And in the end, it, it ends up costing the state more money because they probably end up in residential programs that are much more expensive than uh, the programs that we have. So I, I think the biggest thing that we all need to do is just learn more about the entire system and to educate each other on, on what is happening. Did you wish to elaborate? Yeah, um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, very clean is right. In other states, they have attempted this, and, and some have been successful. Some are still working on it. Um, Washington State is a good example. They have taken people out of their center-based there is no more center base there. However, individuals who are working five days a week are now working maybe two hours a week. And the rest of the, the days they're sitting at home doing what? Um, and that's one of Mary Ann's concerns. I work five days a week. This is really important to me. And now I, I may not work at all because who's going to hire me? Or if I only have one day, what am I going to do with the rest of my time? This is what we all know as we work in our jobs. Our job is really what defines us, and it's the same for the people with disabilities. Their job defines them, and if they don't have it, or they don't have somewhere to go where they can do something productive, that, that can be very detrimental on their their self-worth. And again, just to emphasize, I don't think anyone here is advocating that we want, uh, that we're saying shelter work is the goal for this program. We're simply saying that for certain uh, percentage of the client base it really is in their best options provides them the best opportunity to to be productive so it's it's, it's disappointing to hear uh, judicial organizations outside groups not recognizing what is clearly a uh, basic fact do you have any additional comments before we close that i never was i think the first decision should have been a goal not of anything i think they would have made a goal that was 100 supportive at the same time, I see these people working. I, I don't go out there anymore because my everything stops. And you don't want to say hi. And uh, the ones I hired, uh, I, I get a little bit better because I get a little more great at the same time I get something in a fine cast. So it was really, really kind of a little bit 
um, after uh, the city and the clinic proved to the, to the uh, Department of Economic Development that they have met their end of the bargain in, in uh, building and infrastructure, of, of building and construction. So we're also making it clear that the, uh, the expenditures um, on Rochester special sales tax, which we gave them the authority to do implement, and the general sales tax money that's spent on destination medical center costs for the 128. And I'm here because uh, I think it was assumed that the private EDA would be funded by outside sources and perhaps uh, and, and the, the city would contract with, but it looks more like the city is going to be spending more money on that economic development um, association than was originally thought. And if that happens, it's certainly at the city's discretion how much they choose to spend, but then it should be part of that 128 that we impose on them and not in addition to it so that it will uh, negatively affect the city's um, regular budget for the city of Rochester. Uh, that the mayor of the city council will see, or that it will mean that there will be additional taxes imposed beyond what we originally invested uh, or asked them to invest in the 120 million. So it's a, a simple bill. It's been uh, without controversy to this point, except that I do think that, that people don't all understand the Destination Medical Center. And so uh, we're happy to be here to answer any questions. And we do have um, the city mayor and, and our city manager generally come down, but they have a city council meeting right now and couldn't be here. So um, we have with us their uh, lobbyist, Bradley Peterson, who will answer any questions that you may have. And there is a letter from our city uh, supporting us in your packets. Welcome to the Mr. Peterson. Did you want to say anything for the record? I'm ready to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Bradley Peterson. I'm the firm for me. I'm here in St. Paul and I'm here on behalf of the City of Rochester. I really don't have anything to add beyond the Representative Norton's presentation of the bill, except that this does not change at all or increase the state's contribution. This really has to do with the city's contribution and how it's going to be made. Representative Norton, do you have any other testifiers? This is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify in favor of what's the concerns with House File 62? Uh, seeing none, we'll close the public comment portion of this bill. Did you want to testify, sir, or not? Some of the last changes in the end days of the session 
uh, created a, a, the Economic Development Association as a private entity, not a state entity. And the city of Rochester already has an Economic Development Association, but it was felt that that couldn't concentrate on this project. And so um, we did the best we could to put together a bill that made sense at the time, only to find out that um, the city is going to be spending uh, probably a considerable amount more. They've already spent at least eight million on the, the DMC Corporation Board, which has no, there was no authority to, or no appropriation for that. And the Economic Development Association, they've already spent eight million, and I think there's four, is that correct? That's what they're just anticipating for the next year, and that's going to go on for the, you know, for many years to come. And it just is not fair to the citizens of Rochester who already got a surprise of 128 million additional taxation to keep adding to that um, in addition to it. So I think it was just one of those, uh, we thought private meant private when we, we formi for, uh, formulated the policy for the EDA, but it really is going to be um, a, a, a partnership between the, the EDA and the city of Rochester. They will contract for a significant amount of it. Senator Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, is the governor in support of this bill? The DMCC board, thank you, Mr. Chair. The DMCC board, uh, which has uh, Lieutenant Governor Smith as the director, is supported by it and, and mails in the room to them, and they understand the implication for our city, and they'll speak if you need them to. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then, might, might we expect then um, members of that board, and possibly even the chair herself, to be lobbyists for passage of this bill? Any other questions? Any other questions for members of the committee? With that, the chair renews his motion to have this House of City to recommend and pass the referring committee on taxes. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. The motion fails. Can I have a great task for the committee? Thank you. Staff members, that completes our agenda for the day. We are adjourned. Thank you.